of those little tables that you put a um, laptop computer on, and you put the monitor on top of the table. And, but I didn't need that. What I needed was a power source for my ring. So I took it apart and wired it up so that there are eight power, power pole outlets out here, and it all attaches to this cable, which goes to my power supply. I even put a little uh, voltmeter up here. This is one of those little LED voltmeters that's glued in. So I'll tell me what the voltage is. And that's my project. Now, I, really, I haven't done it in the past two years, I realize. You said something about it should have been done in the past two years. I've done this over 10, 10 years ago, but I just had to repair it last week. So I, feel, I don't feel like bad about upgrading it then. So it's my project. I had to use, I had to use uh, sheet copper because there was no clearance for wires to get through there. And the sheet copper is probably a better conductor than wire would be anyhow. So that's it. But I'm gonna so how many devices do you power off of this, Bill? Right now I only have five plugged in. And they rest on top of the platform? No, I, as a matter of fact, what I did is I recently built a shelf for my rig, which is a four shelf wooden rack for my rig. And this thing is almost superfluous now. But I, I've got it kind of pushed in the back and out of the way. But I use it because it's still a great power distributor. I mean, I've got eight sets of power bolts. And not only that, I've got things like this. I bought this on a Chinese website. And it's a little four-way power pole splitter. So I can <clears throat> plug this into my power poles up here and get a couple more ports. I'm going to show you one other thing, and I'm, I'm, I'm moving out. I don't know if anybody's ever seen this. It's called The Handbook of Amateur Radio and Amateur Satellite Services. It's published by ITU, and this is the equivalent, the ITU equivalent of Part 93. It's got all the, this little book, it's got all the rules that the ITU has applied to amateur radio, and it's also got all the frequency allocations. So it's kind of an interesting thing to see. If anyone would like to read this, I'll pass it around. Just try to get a shot. Oh. My guess is you can find that online on the ITU website. It is online on the ITU website, but, but I, I printed it out and bound it and, and trimmed it, so it's a little book. Holy cow. Nicely done. Yeah. Next. All right, George. An RF powered pair of sneakers. Well, no, that's not quite right. If you all might remember, oh, last year, or maybe it was this year, Phil um, sent an email around asking if anybody was interested in getting involved in a HAMSI project to measure Doppler shift of the ionosphere. And what it would entail would be um, something with, with Linux and something um, to do with um, service mount um, construction and and, um, uh, and another something which I forget <laughs> but uh, oh uh, um, Raspberry Pi three things that I had never done anything with and so I told Phil no thank you but then I thought about it and said wait a minute why don't I try something new so I jumped in and, 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 and signed up and and this is my implementation in a diorama form. <laughs> Remember in fifth grade you had to do dioramas of uh, Washington crossing the Delaware or something like that. This is, um, this is my own personal, personal space weather station. And it's, I was gonna make it pretty and, and wire it up and, and have things not floating around in the box, but they are floating around in the box, but it doesn't really matter. The, um, the hard part was soldering up the little, little little card that has uh, surface mount components on it. And what, what this is, is picture a uh, GPS antenna that's listening to the, uh, uh, G, uh, G, uh, the GPS satellites. And that's being fed to a, a GPS discipline clock. And the clock is set to 9.9990000 megahertz. And you feed in RF, which includes, 
which includes WWV at 10.000 megahertz. And so you get a beat frequency of one kilohertz. That gets sent to the Raspberry Pi here. And according to, de depending on atmospheric conditions, you can see that Doppler shift drift, or that, that, that beat frequency drift, plus or minus about uh, one hertz. And that says something about the, um, the ionosphere. You'd have to ask Phil what that says. I'm not sure. No, but that tells me that that things and there are conditions in the ionosphere that are moving. Oh yeah. And because they're moving, you get a Doppler shift in the frequency associated. That's right. Because the steady or the very stable frequency from the satellite and the st or from the clock, which is disciplined by the satellites, and the stable WWV. The only thing that's changing is the path of the WWV signal. Anyway, it gets plotted up on a chart like this every day at midnight, um, Greenwich time. Um, readings are taken every second and um, plot and, and, and stored in the Raspberry Pi. And then at midnight um, um, UTC, uh, a, a um, algorithm is run to, to plot them. The red curve here, and I'll pass this around, the red curve is received power from um, WWV, and the black curve is Doppler shift with the top up here plus one hertz, and the bottom down here is minus one hertz. So you can see at about dawn here, zing, it goes up, and then slowly all day long during daylight, the Doppler shift um, drops. This is headless, meaning there's no keyboard or monitor on it, but it's got, the, the Raspberry Pi has a uh, Wi-Fi chip in it, and so you can, um, what's it called, VPN, Virtual Private Network, into the thing, and it looks like this on my PC, and here is um, FL Digi, set to 9.999 megahertz, and here is the one kilohertz signal right down in the middle, and that's what's being measured. Um, and I've been collecting data. What's going to happen to that data? That's a good question. This is HAMSI, and it's funded by the National Science Foundation. And this is really just phase one of, of, a, of a bigger project, just to prove that a very simple um, dual um, balance mixer, which is really all this is, dual balance mixer and a couple of filters, um, can be used to measure the Doppler shift. So the next step will be something more um, elaborate and apparently something that I won't have to solder, which is unfortunate <laughs> because it was a lot of fun soldering that thing up. I did borrow um, Peter M1ZRG's, um, what's that called? The Metcal. Metcal soldering station, which is really, really slick. So I'll pass this around, and that's it. No, I noticed right away. Yeah, she threw this so. out. <laughs> you got to find Waldo. You know, if, 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 if at this point in your life, if you can't start celebrating the holidays, what's left? <clears throat> and so we don't have a New Year's uh, <clears throat> sweater, I guess. The by the way, you got this two years ago, and it arrived about uh, two weeks after Christmas. And uh, I complained to the company, and they said, too bad, we got your money. <laughs> to take it or leave it. <clears throat> so it's like a fine Waldo if you can. Um, I have a little levity to start off with a little joke, and it has nothing to do with ham radio. But I'm going to uh, you know, loosen you up for a little bit. You've heard this before, so don't give it. There was a man who was walking along a street in the desert, and he was dying of thirst. He could not survive. He needed the water. And he was so absolutely thir thirsty, and, and he just couldn't get, he couldn't get the spit in his mouth. And he was walking along, and he saw mirages on the road and he was imagining all kinds of things and then finally going over the dunes and seeing the cactus he saw a kiosk on wheels and a guy selling hot dogs and hamburgers 
And he just couldn't believe this. He said, oh my goodness, this is great. He walks up to the guy and says, I need some water. I am dying. And the guy at the, <clears throat> behind the counter said, I can't sell you any of the water, but I'll sell you a tie. He says, a tie? I don't want a tie. I, I don't need some water. He says, I'm sorry. And then the guy walks off. So he's walking along and the wind is blowing and the sun is blazing and he's just dying on his hands and knees. He goes over a dune and he feels the wind blowing against him. And sure enough, he sees a hotel in the distance. And he says, oh my God, they have water at the hotel. And he's running as fast as he can. He gets over the dune, he's running down the sidewalk. He's running into the hotel and the guy says, hey, where do you think you're going? He says, I gotta go in, I gotta get some water. He says, you can't come in without a tie. Just good. <laughs> but, uh, okay. Um, this belongs to Bill. Yes. Well, you have to do that now. <laughs> okay. This is the uh, uh, Bruce said. Bring anything that you have that is related to radio, and I have to backtrack by saying, um, Gene K one A V M. Uh, was given a gift of, about a month or two ago on embroidery. And she has an embroidering machine. And I uh, simply said, this is wonderful. This is your other hobby besides radio. And she does do C CW. So I said, well, what is it that you can do? And so she was doing all kinds of towels and doing all kinds of napkins and all kinds of things that you know, made no sense to me. But she said, I can do something that would be ham radio related. So if <clears throat> I could have my <clears throat> other cohort come over here, I think we could show you what we have done. Thank you. And we have the we have some Christian Dior. We have some Christian Dior fabrics here that have been flown in, especially for this occasion. Uh, this one is for this one is for you dear. And this one is for me. Now, we're going to put this on, and I want to show you the relevancy of ham radio. How we can do this, because Bruce said if it's related to ham radio, bring it in. I you did say that, didn't you? I did say that. It's okay. I'm regretting it now, but I did <laughs> say that. <laughs> well, um, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. This, we, this looks interesting. We have, um, would Lehman help you with yours? No, oh, I can do it just fine. Okay. So, we have now a matching sweatshirt. Right, this is the Gap sweatshirt. You want a little hand in there, honey? No. <laughs> and if you notice, on the left-hand corner of my shoulder, we have our cars. Thanks to this new machine that this wonderful guy I gave her. Yes. She now can embroider t-shirts and sweatshirts. I can't see jeans. Oh. I think I see a business. Yeah. You, oh my gosh. How do you feel, Gene, about embroidering the club jackets that we have on? I, wait, I gotta tell you something about the, uh, the, uh, the first couple of t-shirts that she made. Uh, you don't pay for any of her services, but you do put up the t-shirt and you get what she does. Yeah, and it usually comes out good, but every now and again, the machine might jam, and we get big holes, and it's they like all come out good. They, they all come so out. So you're saying you get what you pay for? Is that, yeah. Okay. But they're usually okay. What was that? No, they came out good. I got some T-shirts that I have. <laughs> I've never seen you wear them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there is another story that goes along with this particular uh, sweatshirt. Um, this is the second one that she had made. She had made another one, and it was as beautiful as it, as it is right now. And there was nothing wrong with it. Everything worked fine, except that one day, about, I would say about two months ago, I had caught a skunk, and I caught it in the trap. Now, when you catch a skunk, what you don't do is to rattle its cage and do anything stupid. So I went over and I put a blanket over the trap, which is what you're supposed to do. They think it's sleepy time and everything is fine. Three days later, I'm thinking, this guy is dead, you know, he's just laid out. Well, no, this, this was a mother skunk that was well fed, and I opened up the um, canvas that was on top of it, and I got sprayed. <laughs> yeah. And I said, this Gene. is the part, by the way, that's radio related. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, Gene, does this sweatshirt smell? Well, as, uh, as I was saying, this is the second 
sweatshirt that we have. So it is related. This, the other one had the same call. Everything was fine. It's just that we had Stunt to. A little bit. We yeah. had to. <laughs> How many stunts were in the cage when you looked in there? Just one. <laughs> it was one. Big skunk. This is a very, well-fed very skunk. Pregnant. Yes. No, I bet. Wow. I, I, I want to tell you that I did manage to release the skunk, and the skunk did manage to go back into the woods, so everything was uh, well-fed. Okay. And I can't believe I'm going to beat Bruce to this remark, but did you think of putting spark above the... No, but they, they, but they sell metallic thread, so you could make it. Spark gap, spark gap. Oh, would be yeah, yeah, that would be great. Yeah, I know. Uh, I didn't think uh, very good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I didn't even think of that. Yeah, that's yeah. good surprise. Right. <laughs> so that's, that's okay. So for the last uh, I don't know, couple of years, I've been trying to get on the the twenty two hundred meter band, trying to adapt my 160 meter inverted L to, to resonate there. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's much like having a, a rubber duck antenna on, on an HT. It's, you know, it's almost like a dummy load. My, the first incarnation didn't work well. I couldn't, it wasn't a big enough coil. So um, this is my second incarnation. Um, this is a, a 1.9 to 4 millihenry variometer. And on the inside, the inner coil is uh, 111 microhenries. So basically, by by turning this, uh, you change the position of the of the inner coil uh, relative to the outer coil, and you either add inductance or you take inductance away from from the overall uh, amount. And there's taps on the outside here. So the idea was, I didn't really know how much inductance I needed, and the, the, each tap is spaced such that the, the, the inductance difference is within, uh, yeah, the inductance difference is basically uh, within that 111 microhenry. So basically, if, I, if I'm out of tap, I can adjust the inner one to get to the next tap so that there's no gap. In, in the range. So, so what was the 1.9 to 4 millihenries? Uh, 1.9 to 4 millihenry is the range. Okay. And ironically, uh, almost 4 millihenries is what's required. Uh, wh when I tried this out, um, I was on the very last tap and I said, let's just Please see four. if it'll resonate there. And it, it did, it resonated at 132 kilohertz. Excellent. And I needed 136. So it takes the whole thing. Um, so this is used in, uh, along with this impedance transformer that unfortunately is broken, uh, got fixed. But the way this, the way this whole thing goes together is, um, coax from the shack would come in here. Okay, um, uh, this end would go to uh, my, my radial field basically uh, uh, connect to where the ground radials are. Um, and this would go to, to here, to basically here. Okay, and then this other end goes to the inverted L. And you basically uh, take your antenna analyzer and start, start adjusting this to try to get the antenna to resonate. At the frequency you want. Yeah, so uh, if you look at the, uh, I, I use a, a nano VNA to, to do this, and if you look at how sharp it is, it's like um, the, the two, two to one SWR I'm sure is very narrow. Um, this is broken, however, the, 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 the core, and uh, I was only able to get it like a like a three to one SWR. Did you overheat the core? I, I don't know. I mean, it's uh, the 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 core is it's basically like one of these. Yeah. And this one's broken in half. Oh. Okay. And, and since um, was it type thirty one? Uh, no, it's uh, FT two ninety seventy seven. 
And I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't think it's a power issue because I used it like all last winter and it was fine when I took it off last winter. Somehow it, it's almost like, you know, it, it got dropped or something. But if, but if you doubled the uh, core, maybe it just overheated. Well, no, that, like I said, when I the last time I used it, when I removed it, it was fine. It was fine. It over the over the summer or something. It somebody dropped it, I think. And the problem here is, you know, it's it's a little bit difficult to change it. Yeah, you got to replant it. So I, so that's my project for for this weekend. So I was only able to get this thing to resonate like three to one, but I know I was I was able to adjust it back and forth so I know it's going to resonate. It's just like I, I can't get the SWR in any lower right now. So this is used in, in, uh, in relation to uh, or so, uh, alongside a, a whisper transmitter that I built. Which again, you, you know, you, you can't test the transmitter without being able to resonate the antenna. And well, you can try it. It's like okay. chicken or the egg thing, you know? So what frequency is this again? 136 kilohertz. 136 kilohertz. What is a quarter wavelength at 136 A lot. Kilohertz. Well, think about it. 2200 meter band. Okay. So, okay. So 20, 20, 2200 meters is like 7,000 feet. Yeah. And so you're talking about a quarter of yeah. 7,000 feet for a quarter wave band. Right. And what I'm using is a, like 155 watt, uh, foot Inverted L. So it's it's like a, a rubber duck antenna on an HT. Yeah. And people are still wondering, like below the uh, AM band? Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even the um, the 630 band that I used, uh, that's below. 472. So anyway, that's my project. Thanks. Good going. Beautiful. Thanks. How much wire in there? But it's quite heavy. Where do you buy your wire? Home Depot. Just you know, I bought a, I don't know, like a 500 foot spool. Okay. And then I, uh, this was uh, from the, the 630 meter one. And you can see I ran out. So I had to go buy a uh, second roll. So there's probably, probably 500 feet maybe on there. Probably more. Did you glue it in? So the, uh, it, it's sort of difficult to make because um, <coughs> first you're, you're, um, you're wrapping it as tight as you can, uh, and you're and you're using um, uh, like like uh, duct tape to hold it on, uh, and then when you're and, and like to make the taps, you're basically uh, putting on a connector and then glue it, and then uh, uh, crimping it and then soldering it uh, and drilling a hole, and then you just keep on doing that, and then when you're all done, you go all right. Now I gotta use the hot glue. So now you start trying to like tack things down better. So it's, I mean, it's pretty good. I mean, there's, there's things you can wiggle, but it's not bad. Nice. How, how long did it take you to wind that up? A long time. A long time. I didn't do it all at once. I, like, you know, I, I don't have that much time. So like, yeah. I probably did this in one sitting. We didn't have a spool in this. Well, I mean, uh, it basically, I, I have a a, a a bobbin with a, with a wire on it, and I just kept turning this, and you know, trying to do it as tight as I can. And then, like, if I had to stop, I put a piece of, of duct tape on. And nobody helped. No, no, I did it in my garage. And now he needs it embroidered. <laughs> so there's a there's a whole whole lot of hot glue. Unless I've decided you're pulling your leg, that's actually a DeLorean flux capacitor. That's right. Then on the outside of the house, you have a right by the transmitter. So uh, this would basically go like right next to the antenna. So you, you know the antenna. This would connect to the antenna. And so uh, I have a vacuum variable on a box. Uh, uh, on the ground, basically, that goes to the inverted L. So I basically connect this to that same point and, and, and disconnect the, the, uh, the coax from, you know, from the antenna so that there's nothing going back. So. Good job. Very nice. Thank you.
So as many of you know, um, I am, am an advisor for CW Academy. And I constantly have anywhere from four to eight uh, teenage students learning Morse code. And one of the challenges is that with the CW Academy curriculum, they're supposed to have keyers in a panel. Now, most of them already have keyers because they tend to be built-in modern transceivers, and you can put those in a practice mode and just get the side tone without transmitting. But they need paddles, and paddles these days are not very inexpensive. I think a, a bencher is know, 180 bucks or something, right? So um, it's always a challenge getting them set up. And I've gone to great lengths with some students finding paddles that they can borrow from people, or I have set paddles out and never had them come back. So I know several members of the club have uh, played around with 3D printed paddles uh, in the past and they're the kinds of ones you see on eBay and I've always found them to be really pretty, I don't want to say terrible, but not great as far as performance goes. Um, they tend to bind or they tend to be very, very loose, um, they just, they're just not very good. And again, when a student's trying to learn, you want them to have a good experience and learn on something pretty good. So I was on, I know some people don't like it, eBay one day, and not eBay, um, Facebook one day, and I came across a posting where this guy had this 3D printed paddle that seemed to solve all of the pitfalls that I found from other paddles. The beautiful thing about it is that the finger pieces have bearings both on the top and the bottom. So physically, there's nothing that can bind. Um, and this is also magnetically, uh, there's magnetic springs on this. In other words, no physical springs, just two magnets that basically you can position them against each other and that will give you the tension that you desire in the paddle. Um, the way the designer of this at the time I uh, had these mounted to a table, he had a, like a steel panel, and he had four little magnets on the corner, and the magnets stuck to the steel panel, and I didn't like that, and I sent him an email, and I said, you know, if you just change this slightly, you can load the bottom of this with pennies, and copper pennies are fairly heavy, and I don't know if you know this, the neat thing about the U.S. penny is that if you go around the world, almost every currency has something close to the value of a penny, okay, that's almost exactly the same size. So I think there's a, there's a euro that's, a, that's equivalent to it, the Canadian penny is equivalent to it, there are many, many currencies where the coin is very similar. And so that's, well, the you can hear it, that's what's weighting it down. So anyway, uh, Jim kindly printed up a bunch of these. Uh, one time we thought about doing this as like a club project, and um, I've built several of these. I've given some of these to my students. Um, the beautiful thing is they're repeatable. They all work identical. Um, it's really nice. So I'll pass this around, and if anybody wants to come up, I've got a second one here. If anyone wants to play with it on the keyer, you can do that. You can do that as well. So how long so, did it take you to, to make that? So, the 3D printer, Jim can tell you how long it takes to print the parts. Well, no, I mean, the, after the parts are printed. About, a, about an hour of labor to put that together, from, from beginning to end. I think it goes a little faster once you've done a couple of them, but, and it's nice. And I gotta tell you, I have one sitting on my operating desk, that's the one that's on the on my table, and it's, it's right next to my Begali, and I'm not going to tell you it's like the Begali, but it's, it's a pretty good performing paddle. And by the way, um, I've shared this with other like really good CW operators, like when I go out to K1 Triple T's, I've brought this out, they also find it hard to believe that you can take a 3D printer and print something like this. And the parts for this, I think, the problem is when you buy the, the uh, mechanical parts off of, um, what's the, uh, the Chinese website you no, use? No, 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 when you buy them out, out of uh, Ali, Express. AliExpress, you got to buy some parts quantities, you know, 50, and you only need like four of them kind of thing. But 
If you were to do this in some kind of volume, I think the parts would be about $15 or something for it. So, works great. Hmm. How many pennies in each one? I think there's about two and a half dollars worth of pennies, something like that. I never even, I never really, I never really counted, counted. And I also figure out a way, there was, there's a couple of places here, like under these posts, where you don't have the same depth. So by chiseling out the plastic a little bit better, you can stick dimes in there. The dimes fit, so it just adds a little bit more weight. It's not as heavy as I would like it, but with these like rubber feet that I found, um, it sticks pretty well to the surfaces. So you know the fabric, the fabric store can get green felt and glue it. That's what I do with my. Uh, you know, how, however you do it, I don't. I don't bother, you know what's funny is that if I'm sending for a while with the, with the Begali, I get really sloppy. And when I go back to this, it, it, it forces me to think a little bit more about what I'm doing and it, and it makes me better on the Begali when I go back to the Begali. So, um, I don't know, but anyway, that's my project and if anybody wants to, I know we have some CW people here in the audience. So if anybody wants to come and play with this and try it, you're more than welcome. Can you flip the... Uh, do what? Do you have a switch to flip the left and right? Uh, no. It's all right. Well, how do you know it's wrong? Because that's how I sound. You're left-handed. Just like at the Begali booth in Dayton, huh? <laughs> Not bad. I like that. I had never heard of magnets being used in such a thing until Jim was, was made. Up. And I said, well, that's kind of cool. Yesterday I was reading the ham radio outlet um, blurb, and the um, Advertisement for, I forget what it was, um, very famous keys, um, it was saying that they, they don't use magnets because what they have are better than Fiberflex or something? Yeah, it was Fiberflex. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm saying, what, what's up with that? So, you, again, you adjust the spring tension. there's spring tension or there's magnets. Yeah. There are people who swear by the magnets and um, won't do anything else. The neat thing about the springs is that you can mechanically make the paddle such that there's only one spring providing the tension. So it's going to be identical regardless of which way you go. I, I, you know, I don't know, but I'll tell you this, as opposed to like the other 3D printed paddles where you take either the spring out of a ballpoint pen and yeah. wedge it in there. Or I know you came up with the idea using like foam, right? Yeah. Um, I think this is this is much better. Okay. So, I put magnets. Yeah, correct. The crappy first one. That was the first thing I did. Put magnets. Oh, did you? On there. Man, the little magnets. You know, you get they, they come in a tube and they're and they're really tiny and there's like a hundred of them that come at a time and and they just they stick to everything. <laughs> They're, they're tiny, they're like the tiny little batteries that you put in a watch kind of thing. Like they're, uh, so. Thanks for that, Thank you.